Hey there, I'm Heather, and today I'm going to talk for 15 minutes or so about structural interpretation and some best practices to kind of build on my last uh, mini lecture for this course. Um, so getting going, before we dive into interpretation, I want to talk about quality control. So I've mentioned this a few times um, throughout the series of lectures. Uh, but I want to pause and really, really talk about it. So one of the first things we want to do when we get our seismic data, besides reading the processing report, um, an acquisition report, and just noting anything that's odd um, or something that we should pay attention to <laughs> from those reports, um, first thing we want to do when we load our data is we want to scroll through it in, in all directions. So from the inlines to the cross lines and the time slices. You Often when you're doing these quality controls, you can also start to pay attention um, for any anomalous features or areas where the data quality changes, or maybe some geologic features that you even want to pay attention to. And um, yeah, and so that'll, that'll just help you understand if there's any acquisition or processing concerns um, and things you want to pay attention to when you're doing your interpretation. I'll say, I'm going to show you an example in a couple slides. And then the next slide that kind of shows scrolling through it, and I'm going to try to talk through it at the same time. But what I do is I, as soon as I load the data, I run some sort of coherence or variance attribute, and I'll talk about those later in this class, um, because that is another uh, key kind of way to look at the seismic data to help you QC. So I'll, I'll do QC work right away on the seismic amplitude data and then some sort of coherence, variance, similarity type cube. Okay, so let's get going. Let's get going. Okay, so here we're starting to scroll through the data. Um, and this is an example from the Hart textbook. So we can notice um, that overall things look pretty good. We've got higher frequencies up shallow. The frequencies kind of die out. Things get a little bit more chaotic and noisy as we get lower, of course, as expected. We notice that Lystric fault. Um, and so now we want to look at it in the strike direction to the Lystric Fault. And one of the things you can notice is that it's not super clear, right? Um, and this is because we're not looking, as we move through it in strike direction, we're not really looking at it in the optimal direction for identifying the fault. All right, so now we're going to look at the amplitude going down through time. And so we notice um, acquisition patterns. Here we notice a, a nice, lovely channel. We can see that there's some horizontal striping still. Um, here we've got some more unusual patterns that look interesting. As we go through the fault, we see some kind of zebra striping, which tells us that we've got dipping strata. So very kind of expected um, with those geometric reflections. And then as we get deeper, we see the noisy data also. All right, so hopefully that kind of gave you an idea of, of how I would talk through a a quick QC for identifying noise problems. We saw noise, we saw acquisition footprint. We also picked out some really interesting geometric patterns that we want to maybe look at a little bit more. Okay, um, so some general fault picking advice is I like to pick one fault at a time and I like to start with the most obvious ones. Um, so even if that main fault isn't exactly in my area of interest but it's adjacent to it, I find that starting picking um, a, a kind of simpler fault, if you've got one, um, it helps me get familiar with the data. So it lets me understand maybe some of the nuances of, of what I'm seeing in the seismic data. So you don't always want to jump into the most complicated aspects first, but there is in this quality control kind of initial stage, there is kind of like a a bit of a getting to know the data, getting to, to notice, you know, with a, a large fall or a very easy horizon to pick out, um, you can start to, to get to understand what some of the, uh, you know, seismic, you know, if, if there's little issues in the seismic or what the acquisition footprint looks like, or if you have, um, you know, some, some of those kind of smiley faces from the migration. So don't, don't jump into the most complicated first. Okay, so you pick the most obvious fault first. Um, you can do reflection offsets, changes, and dips. You know, as I mentioned before, you want to try to pick your fault moving perpendicular to the strike of the fault. And so a lot of cases, this, you want to use arbitrary slices. 
um, and arbitrary lines. Um, you know, a lot of folks just tend to move through inlines and cross lines, and that's not the ideal way to interpret. Um, you also want to use coherence volumes. So I mentioned that, and I'll show you some later on. Um, and then you also don't need to pick on every line, um, but rather you may want to pick on a grid, depending on how complicated your area is, your region is. Um, maybe you pick every 10 inlines and every 10 cross lines. Maybe it's every 20. Um, I tend to use an adaptive uh, picking strategy where in areas where it's more complex, I may, may pick every five lines or every two lines or you know maybe in some cases every line uh, just to make sure I'm doing it right. So I'm not a big fan of auto picking. Um, I like to manually pick myself and this is all part of the process of trying to get the framework and understand the data and what's going on before I start using some of the auto pickers, particularly in 3D. Okay. So when we're working in 3D and when we have the, the pleasure of getting to work with 3D data, um, it's really good to use the vertical end time slices. So not every interpretation program has this, but most of them do. Um, if not, you can have a time slice next to a, uh, an inline window or cross line or vertical section. So keep that in mind. And so one of the things you'll notice here is we've got, um, our laser pointer. So we've got our seismic in kind of a vertical section, and then we've got that time slice. And here in this lower section, we've added on that coherence. So coherence is a great simple edge detector. And so it's able to detect when one waveform isn't similar to its neighbor, <laughs> essentially. And I'll talk about um, more about this later on in, in a lot of detail. And so the coherence is, is loaded on here. And so we're actually able to see with the, the black white of the coherence where some of those faults line up. Um, we can even notice some of the faulting patterns on the time slice too. They can be a little bit harder to pick out. All right, so let's talk about some horizon mapping. So um, horizon interpretation, it's very similar to fault interpretation. So begin by scrolling through your data in line cross line time slices understand the fault framework. And this is why I, if I have a faulted area, I'll start with trying to understand the fault faults and the fault framework first, and then I'll move into the horizon interpretation. Um, if you've got well logs that are tied to seismic, you wanna use those so that you know what your peaks and troughs are representing, if it's a particular formation that you're picking. And if you don't have any wells that are available, you can just start with mapping some prominent reflections where you have more confidence. So again, um, you may not need this uh, very prominent reflection for the purpose of your seismic, but it's a way to get you grounded. So maybe you look for a very prominent reflection that you have a uh, high confidence in your interpretation with that's just above or just below your area of interest. So there's a couple of key aspects with horizon interpretation. First, you want to understand what type of horizon you're picking. Is it an unconformity? Is it a lithologic contact? Or maybe it's something else. Um, you can use a systematic grid for picking. So just like I mentioned before, in lines and cross lines, you could start moving through those and then fill in with arbitrary lines. Um, it's a little bit easier to stick to in lines and cross lines with horizon picking. Um, and again, you can use that as same adaptive grid technique. Um, auto picking, yes, go ahead and do it, um, but QC it and be aware, like run some tests on your auto picker. Don't just use the default settings but you can change in, in all programs, you can change how sensitive it is. So maybe you wanna set it um, so that it's not over picking, it's not jumping faults. And, and that's the way I would rather do it. Like I like to slowly move through picking my horizons rather than try to do a crazy auto picker, map out the whole seismic volume at once and then have to go back and erase it all. <laughs> so again, we all have different methods, that's mine. Um, and then after mapping your horizon, um, you want to go through and smooth uh, the data. And all the, uh, all the software packages have ways to do this too. Um, but you want to be careful not to over smooth so that you lose important structural details. But you want to smooth enough where you're not seeing the jitteriness of the seismic noise in your structure map. And so here's an example of what that looks like. 
So when we originally pick and if we snap it to the, the middle of the red, we get that blue line. So this kind of jagged blue line. And that's, that's natural. Like I love using the snapping tools. Um, so you could have it snap to the highest peak or the lowest trough. You could have it snap to a zero, zero crossing. So all of these are, are tools you can set in your, your software. And then you could see it looks very jaggedy and that's just because of the noise of the seismic. Um, and then you would smooth it. So um, I'll also pause here <laughs> to, to say, you know, be very careful in how you name and save your horizons. So I may start off with a grid and then I'll save that. Usually with my initials, it's like, um, what, what do we call this? Uh, Horizon Blue HB December 24 um, <laughs> grid. And then when I go to auto pick or fill it in or interpolate, I'll call it the same thing. But instead of grid at the end, I'll, I'll put, um, you know, like auto or something like that. And then same thing for smooth. So then you could add smooth to it. So um, that allows me, if I'm not happy with how it ended up being smoothed or auto picked, I can go back to the original grid picking that I did. Um, because if you overwrite that, then you could end up losing, you know, days worth of time that you spent carefully uh, mapping that one horizon. Okay, um, so some of the things you want to pay attention to after you pick your horizons, um, you want to think about, okay, well, now I've picked one horizon, now I should pick some others in the faulted area. Do they make sense? Do I see thickening and thinning between the horizons of those sediment packages? Does that make sense geologically with what I know is going on? Um, you can use that flattening technique I talked about previously to understand the timing and fault movements and then contouring when you create the surfaces can be really useful in visualization. And so again, here's an example of flattening from the Hart textbook. And so this is a really great tool for understanding structural evolution. Um, as I mentioned before, it's just like a very quick button click. <laughs> um, and so this is an example um, from in the, the North Sea, um, picking a graben. And what you can see is when they flattened on that red line from B, and then they flattened on it in A, you can actually see the, the thickening of the packages and how they align with faults. And so that gives you an idea of how active those faults were in terms of creating um, depositional space while those sediments were being laid down and deposited. Okay, so depth conversion. Um, a lot of what we may start out with is time data. And so if possible, and if you have a lot of uh, heterogeneous velocity, um, what you'll wanna do is correct for velocity and do a depth conversion. And so this gives you even better structural um, reconstructions. Um, so working in the depth domain, your structure tends to be more accurate. And so you can use get velocity data from the processing uh, velocity, from borehole seismic data, sonic logs. Um, you can even do tomography. Um, I talked about checkpoint check shots also. And so what you want to do is use these to build a more accurate velocity model and then do that depth conversion if your study warrants it. And so just to kind of show how structures are not that accurate in time section, um, this is a great example from Fred Schroeder, where if we're looking at time data, up shallow, our uh, vertical to horizontal exaggeration um, may be one to one. But as we get deeper and those velocities get faster, just with the natural um, compaction and increase of velocities with depth, we end up with a larger vertical exaggeration. And so that means some of these structures we're seeing down here closer to 2.7 um, seconds are not actually that big, but rather they're being exaggerated, um, particularly if we're comparing them to the shallow structures. Um, and here's just an example from the Hart textbook that shows very practical examples of depth conversion. And so you can see on the left, we start with time structure maps and then create velocity maps from the well control points. And then when we create the depth structure maps on the far right, <laughs> um, the, the structure has changed you know, subtly. The direction of the dip has changed. Um, and so this is something that you always want to do if you're able to.
And then in one more example of this, using seismic data rather than a cartoon, in A, we have the original um, time structure map for a carbonate in the Williston Basin. So carbonates, we, you know, we should automatically think, okay, those will have very different velocities um, than clastic sediments that may be surrounding them. Okay, so we see the, you know, just kind of hone in to the location of where the structural high is up here. Um, when a velocity map was made with the well log data that was available, you can notice that it's not a uniform velocity map. And so when the time is um, converted into depth, as shown on the lower right hand side, you'll notice that now these two wells um, are actually on the top of structure, which they weren't before in the time structure map. Um, so anyway, something to keep in mind. <laughs> And then here's another example in the Canadian Rockies um, where we've got time migrated versus depth migrated. Okay, so we're going back to different types of processing. We've got time migrated versus depth migrated. And if we zoom in to kind of the, the area of interest here, um, we can notice that there are some clear differences in the, the structure of what we're seeing. And so in the time migrated, this lower... Um, doming kind of looking feature um, appears very flat, <laughs> but in the depth migrated data, it actually does have that structure. And so that's a good thing to keep in mind if we're interested in trying to find structural highs um, for hydrocarbon accumulation. All right, so to just wrap up this quick summary of some basic structural workflows, um, again, just remember initial data, QC it, check for processing issues, check for data gaps. Um, particularly if you have land data. You want to understand those acquisition and, and processing parameters. Um, with fault interpretation and horizon mapping, um, you want to work very systematically, usually starting with a, an easy to map fault or an obvious fault that you have high confidence in. Same thing with a uh, horizon. Um, so start simple, get to know the data, and then kind of dive more into your area of interest. Um, in horizons, you can work in inlines, cross lines, and time slices. In faults, you may want to pay attention and use arbitrary lines if you need to, because faults you want to pick perpendicular to the strike uh, direction. Um, time depth, always keep that in mind depending on the purpose of your study, if you need to be working in depth or need to convert to depth um, to get a better understanding of the, the true structural features. And, you know, of course, always make sure when you're done with your interpretation that it makes geologic sense. Um, it's also good to always document your workflow. And this is where it's, it's good to start talking to some of your coworkers, whether they're other students or other geologists in your company, um, to talk them through your hypothesis. And then if they give you feedback like, oh, well, did you consider, um, did you consider this? Um, keep that in mind because it, you'll have a stronger interpretation and a more robust interpretation if rather than ignoring other hypotheses, um, you actually critically think about them and rule them out. And so that'll give you more confidence. So in any case, thanks for listening.